आप इसी में सुन लो डिवाइस हो जाएगा in terms of uh, the category called renaissance and the historical period called renaissance and uh, the fact that the european renaissance and english renaissance are quite uh, different uh, things in terms of the emphasis which is there in uh, european uh, renaissance and art and uh, with english renaissance we generally end up talking about uh, this uh, can you see me am i uh, sort of do you want to reply because it's a very bad day so i have kept in terms of uh, it, it being uh, foggy and dark by 3 uh, pm so i just close the windows and uh, sort of put on the uh, table lamp and if you think that you need more light uh, let me know i will switch on more light that's for so uh, uh, uh so this is all the this will introduce you and uh, then we will do the process okay okay are you Good afternoon. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, okay. 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 Good afternoon, everyone. Present here. So it is a pleasure to invite you all to this lecture series by intersection. Uh, 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 is the under the ages of the PHU or under the past PHU. Also, uh, uh, Swati Ma'am here is an uh, associate uh, professor of English at Vishwamitra. That's why I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just quickly, quickly interrupt. I am actually a professor. You're probably looking at an older bio note. You're probably looking at an older note. Uh, I have been professor for about two years. Yeah. It doesn't matter at all. Yeah. But whatever. Yeah, yeah apart from this other uh, the research areas include female and gender translation studies theater of the tagore and i think the 20th century, century bengal and uh, uh, professor swati has also been honored with the charles wallace fellowship for translation study in 1996 as a first translation translator in residence at the british center for literary studies the university of the east anglia norwich uk and uh, some of my noted publications also include uh, the stream within short stories by contemporary bengali women uh, am i right ma'am yes so that that is a collection that i did with my friend yes it's not my work and uh, apart from that uh, you have also had many articles in journals and anthologies Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I would uh, like to thank Vivek uh, for uh, calling me up and actually uh, reminding me that uh, I began off as a racist, uh, feminist racist scholar. I work in a entirely different field now with the history of the institution where I teach in the history of Bishop Haradi, which was uh, actually founded uh, very soon after PHU, which was founded in 1916, which was founded in 1915, though its formal inauguration happened in 1921. Uh, that is a history that I've been working on for the past few years. So I've almost forgotten that, you know, uh, I think, of course, I am a feminist, and I do a lot of uh, uh, this is not uh, writing, uh, but it's also what we call activism. Uh, and we have an organization where I work as But so I want to really thank Vivek for uh, sort of taking me back to my uh, past and for uh, inviting me for this uh, talk on, uh, on my doctoral work, on my research, which I did with a very famous uh, uh, Renaissance scholar, Professor Shubhra Jyoti. Uh, but I'm going back to that work, so this is not something that. Uh, I'm usually invited now to talk about the uh, not to talk about other feminist issues and feminist uh, religious texts. So uh, that's uh, really wonderful, and it's great that all of you have uh, given up on your afternoon siesta or uh, other activities to come for this uh, talk. And, uh, I, uh, I, I think uh, it's for me talking to the young is always uh, interesting thing. And, uh, each talk is different because the responses that one gets in these lectures are all uh, very different. So um, let me just uh, quickly begin by uh, asking whether, uh, I'm assuming of course that you uh, know uh, through your classes, class lectures, uh, definitely very important uh, ideas that constitute uh, the core of uh, Renaissance thinking. Uh, but you are probably also, and I'm hoping you are aware of the fact that uh, the Renaissance studies has been through in the last uh, 20 or 30 years, one which has been subjected to two, one which has been the focus of a lot of uh, critical uh, intervention, uh, really intervention, I mean, from largely what we call theoretical positions. So, for example, cultural materialism, historicism, and systems. So, uh, and, and of course, many others, but uh, those related, related to new studies of theater, the ideas of the body, uh, and so on and so forth. Many of which have overlapping uh, sort of relations with uh, cultural materialism, historicism, and Marxism. Well, Marxism predates cultural materialism because uh, it's, it is really from Raymond Williams's work that cultural materialism begins. Uh, new historicism, on the other hand, is a Foucauldian work which has which is gained much popularity. Uh, feminism has some relationship, feminist thinking about the Renaissance has a uh, relationship with these two kind of theoretical positions, but it is also like Marxist readings, something which goes back long way. It goes uh, back, as a matter of fact, to the 19th century and even earlier. But uh, for the purposes of this particular lecture, I would like to begin with a very significant 20th century, early 20th century intervention by a very well-known uh, female and feminist writer, who was also a modernist writer, Virginia Woolf. Uh, so let me just quickly tell you how I've organized uh, this uh, talk, right? Uh, so I would begin with a very brief introduction to what I call the feminist interrogations of the Renaissance. That uh, what the Renaissance was and how the ideas of Renaissance uh, underwent significant change with feminist questioning uh, the basic premises that uh, were part of the Hardian ideas of the Renaissance. Uh, in this particular, today's talk, I will be focusing 
on what the situation you have Shakespeare, because I guess that maybe uh, all of you would be familiar with uh, Shakespeare's text. So you also, I'm sure, have read, uh, probably read uh, Marlowe Johnson. That's what the mimic says. And uh, also uh, Webster, maybe Middleton. Master. But I did, I did not want to spread this very sort of wide. I just thought I would concentrate and focus on Shakespeare. Uh, so I'll begin now with the wolf, and then I will suggest that uh, a very important inheritor of the questions or some of the issues that wolf raises is John uh, Kelly. And uh, with these two, I move on to. And, and that, that is what the, my uh, lecture today is titled, uh, Feminist Readings of the Renaissance, uh, Representations of the Unruly Woman in the Discourse and Drama. So from beginning with Wolf and a little bit of an introduction to Joan Kelly, I will suggest that uh, one very significant area which we uh, sometimes do and sometimes don't talk about is what we call discourses, the discursive constructions of femininity and uh, in the early modern period. So the ideas of early modern patriarchy, which we can get from uh, discourse, right? Discourse, of course, as you would be familiar with, similar to ideology, but is about what is articulated, what is possible, or what is permissible within a given historical moment to be articulated, to be written about, to be spoken about. So this, I believe, is a very important field we need to perhaps understand and know to uh, look at the question of representation uh, of gender of gender politics in the uh, early modern period, in the early modern stage. So I would like to suggest that, uh, you know, the early modern theatre, this is not uh, this is something which is uh, a new thing which I'm suggesting. This has been suggested uh, over a long period by especially new historicists, that uh, the early modern theatre, the early modern stage, uh, the means uh, or systems through which the plays were produced actually created a very strong subversive potential. The people who wrote these plays, the playwrights, uh, and the manner in which uh, they were located within the society in which they wrote, which is not anything uh, close to how we understand the uh, position of Shakespeare now as a playwright. Uh, created a possibility of uh, being subversive, though of course uh, they were always, they had to be careful about censorship. So it's a very interesting, tricky, and I would say intelligent and subtle way in which these playwrights were writing, so that they were working within what we would say patriarchal ideology and discourse, but they had a possibility, they had a scope of within the place, within uh, what is uh, essentially a dialogic mode, to question and sometimes challenge these positions of patriarchy. So we are looking at a very interesting and a complex phenomenon in which uh, the relationship between drama and discourse is not simple one way, it's not uh, linear, and it's definitely not one which is only derivative. So it's not as if drama is just deriving from discourse. It is shaped by discourse. It also shapes discourse or ideas which are articulated in that time. And uh, I, I believe, or at least what I want to talk today uh, about, is that one of the central concerns you many of these uh, early modern discourses is the figure of the unruly woman. The unruly, the disobedient, disruptive woman. Uh, this is a figure who, which, uh, who uh, is characterized who was very interestingly called the woman on top by a very famous French historian, Natalie Zimon Davis, a historian of the early modern period. So, uh, <laughs> Natalie Zimon Davis and the other uh, Renaissance scholar whose work uh, has, I think, 
is very central in many ways to feminist thinking. It's Peter Stalibras, who has a very uh, useful and accessible essay called Patriarchal Territories, the Body and Closed, in which he goes on to suggest that uh, the discourses of the periods, especially sermons and uh, religious writings, uh, homilies, uh, intentionally talk about the idea of the woman, the good woman is one who is closed within the territory of the home. So a woman who is not out in the public, a woman who is within the household, and a good woman is also a woman who is passive and silent. Right? So uh, the threshold of the house, the mouth, these are the transgressive uh, sort of, you know, uh, the, the, the places where transgressions happen. So stepping out of the house, into the public space, uh, communicating too much in public, uh, doing public speaking, behaving in a way which is unwomanly or things which patriarchy considered uh, deeply problematic and uh, troubling. So much of the injunctions that we find in discourses is against such women. Uh, this, I think, is a, this one of the things that you would find in the play after play. You would find other possibilities also within these uh, parameters. Those of you who read comedies of Shakespeare will immediately say that there seems to be uh, you know, potential for uh, women in these plays where they prosperous and they seem to have a lot of freedom and they're definitely funky and very attractive and uh, much more attractive than the men in the place. Of course, we have to remember that Renaissance stage is itself transvestite. That is, there are no women on the Renaissance stage. There are just boys, young boys and men. So those characters that we understand as women and those who are the lawyers for everything that they seem to this are actually played by boys. This, of course, is uh, something that feminists and other scholars and related scholars have pointed out. I will not talk much about that, but then uh, go on by beginning with Virginia Woolf, uh, John Kelly, and then go to the discursive destruction. And even as I do that, I will take instances from plays to substantiate my arguments. So, if you are familiar with Virginia Woolf's room of one's own, are you familiar with Virginia Woolf's room of one's own? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. That's great. So, you have read uh, Virginia Woolf, and you remember in chapter 3, she talks about Judith Shakespeare, right? Uh, and uh, she says, uh, quoting, when you imagine, since facts are hard to come by, what would have happened if Shakespeare had wanted to give the sister? Called Judith, let us say. Right? And then she goes on to construct a, a story. A story because Judith Shakespeare, of course, does not exist in, uh, as far as Wolf is concerned, does not exist in the archives, in the libraries, in the books that she has read. Because there is no Judith Shakespeare. Of course, Shakespeare had a daughter whose name was Judith. So, what she goes on to, of course, construct is the story of a very talented uh, young woman who uh, meets a terrible fate because it is not possible, as I said, during the Renaissance to become a writer for the public stage. Uh, she is, as you remember in the text, she runs off to London, like her brother. And unlike her brother, of course, she cannot uh, have a public profession. And she is uh, seduced and directed by Nick Greenblatt Mancha, who was our satire, she says, to take pity on her, and she taught herself the chance, and she commits with the tragedy. This is not the tragic story. But apart from the story of Judith Shakespeare, what does something very interesting? Uh, she suggests that we have to note that there is a gap between representation and reality of women in her modern life. I think she's one of the first people to have noticed this very interesting uh, sort of gap. 
this is the difference between what seems to be the real and what seems to be the representation. This is quoting her again. A very clear composite being that emerges imaginatively is of the highest importance, practically she is completely insignificant. Some of the most inspired words, the most profound thoughts in the literature fall from her list. In real life, she could hardly read, she could scarcely spell, and was the property of her husband. Of course, Wolf is not thinking about aristocratic privilege women. She's talking about what we were told in the middle class. Though the early modern period, the category for the middle class did not exist in the way that it exists now. Then Wolf says that, you know, she makes a kind of uh, appeal, as it were, to her uh, audience, which are these students from New and Hill Garden. She says that we need to have information. We need to have information about the lives of ordinary Elizabethan women. Uh, she suggests that some brilliant woman students, like the ones who are sitting today in the audience, should uh, look at parish registers and accounts. And that's so astute because when you look at the micro history written by uh, very famous uh, religious scholars later on, they're looking at parish registers, records of churches. And uh, the local sort of, you know, uh, documents to suggest that we need to know at what age did she marry, how many children had she as a role, what was her house like, had she a room to herself, did she do the cooking? So she's suggesting that we need to rewrite social history from a gynocentric position to the position of a woman. And, and we know that Wolf is no Marxist, yet her list suggests that she favors a materialist attention to culture. Right? And long before the advent of cultural materialism. So, with this, these are the two questions that I would want you to remember. And it is with this that I go, that I have chosen to talk about this course, because the relationship between representation and reality, the point to which Wolf draws our attention, between these two, how does one negotiate what is going, what is real and how its relationship to representation works? I would suggest that this course is a very important, uh, as it were, bridge between the real and what is represented. So, in questioning the very idea of the possibility of Shakespeare's system, in tracing the disjuncture between uh, representation and also culture and reality, and in its form for meticulous examination of archives, which have been lost in the mainstream historical studies, I would suggest that chapter three of Rome of One's Own is uh, one that anticipates the core of feminist Shakespearean studies for the next 70 years or so. Then the text that I would like to draw your attention to is um, Joan Kelly. Joan Kelly was a uh, Burkhardian uh, scholar, right? She began off by believing that this is what the Renaissance was, and this is a very exalted period, and also the fact that many women did not have equal footing. That is what Burkhard says. And then, uh, as it happened, she became a feminist. And one of the questions that she asks is, uh, you know, suppose we look at the Renaissance, uh, through the vantage point of women, what is it that we get? And she says that there's a startling discovery that she has. She says that the very signs of change in Italy between 1350 to 1530, which is the 14th century to 16th century, the development of modern states, the rise of mercantile and manufacturing economy, the dissolution of feudal hierarchy, the bonds, the revival of Latin learning, these are all categories that Burkhard refers to. But you read is the most a symptom of Renaissance affected women adversely. So that her famous uh, empathic assertion is that there was no Renaissance for women, at least not in the Renaissance. So Renaissance as a reawakening did not happen as far as women were concerned during the period, historical period that we are calling the Renaissance. And uh, a later feminist historians, of course, have drawn attention to the limitations of uh, Kelly's critique. They have pointed out that she's looking at very limited documents and she's in many ways skewed in her understanding. 
But some of the categories that she is uh, using are, uh, are to gauge the status of women are particularly useful. And this is what she says. Regulation of female sexuality as compared with male sexuality. Number two, women's economic and political roles. The education of training necessary for work, property, and power. The cultural roles within shaping the outlook of society. Access to education or the institutions necessary for this. And the ideologies of women in this symbolic paradox of society. So I'm looking really at ideologies of about women, but looking at it not just in terms of the views or opinions or the dominant ideas, but also writing that exists about women, which we are calling the discourses in the early modern patriarchy about women. So, uh, uh, so, what uh, I begin off is uh, with uh, one very important idea of feminism, which is coming not only from feminist thinkers, but also from social historians, people like our historians, famous historians, Williams, Lawrence Stone, David Underdown, Keith, Bryce, and Barry Ray, who have characterized the early modern period. And I'm using this historical category, I'm not using the, this first, I'm not using the superstitive category of the Renaissance here who has suggested that this is a period of transition, very important transition, where social order and hierarchy was under enormous pressure. So David Underdown, for example, points out that the early modern was a period where there was a crisis of order, right? And why crisis of order? Because there was an excessive population growth, there was inflation, land shortage, poverty, and vagrants. So if you read uh, the Renaissance plays carefully, you will find uh, you know, echoes of all of these disorders continuously mentioned. We usually don't pay attention to them. So like King Lear, who says that uh, I took very little care of the poor, uh, and the fact that there is a character called Tom of Bedlam, who is the big you know, Bedlam was mad. So somebody who's been driven to madness by Bob. Of course, we know that um, this has been played by uh, Edgar, but the very fact that Edgar can perform as a Duba Tom of Bedlam is a sign of the fact that there were such figures uh, who were familiar, who, but who, not just playwrights, but the audience would have been familiar. So. Elizabeth's reign and later in uh, James's reign, there would be such people who were there seen as a kind of threat. Now, why is this important for us? It is important for us because when you have a crisis of order, when uh, there is the destabilization of uh, this order, then the focus often falls on the fact that there is possibly something wrong in this because the status quo of gender, that is the relationship between men and women, the relationship that men and women ought to have in society is being disturbed. In other words, what is a traditional uh, patriarchal system in which men are in power and women are subordinate is undergoing a kind of shift. This is, of course, is also reinforced continuously in uh, the anti-feminist uh, literature that is the servants, the homilies uh, that we find uh, during that period. We will come to that. Linda Bose, a very famous feminist Renaissance scholar, suggests that not only was there an increase of witchcraft trials, I'm not saying witchcraft, but witchcraft trials, and other court accusations against women, but crimes and punishments were progressively polarized by gender. In other words, you were looking at crimes in terms of crimes committed by women with a greater degree of attention, right? Uh, women were, of course, uh, one of the greatest uh, accusations that existed from the, the time of the Middle Ages and even earlier was that of witchcraft. And witchcraft was a very gendered kind of crime, which is usually women. Men were not witches. 
he could be with us. Uh, so the fact that the member associated with a kind of practice which is seen as going against what, going against the order of society, going against life itself, would suggest that there is a kind of anxiety that is existing within her. Today I will not talk about the witchcraft, which we have been talking about Right. So, what the scholars have drawn our attention to is the increase, as it were, in these cases, right? Cases which are being brought to court, cases which are being brought to public notice. There's a lot of public punishment which is generated around the with or of the Andrew woman. So. I want you to notice this. There is a very interesting kind of slippage, you know, moving from one to the other. So, for example, a witch is not only a person who practices a certain kind of, uh, you know, uh, or who, who practices witchcraft, but any woman who goes against the system, the normative system of family and society, for example, it's holding. Right. So, so the fact that she, 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 she challenges her husband, speaks against him, him uh, in any woman goes sharp of tongue, a scold, she would also be called a witch. And both these categories are inflated, conflated with the idea of a woman who sexually used morals. So, the whoring, right. So, a woman who was a witch would would be accused of being a whore, would accused be accused of being a sure scold. Or a sure scold would be accused of being a sexually loose woman and she would have been practicing. You just have to remember a play like Othello, which I will talk about in a to uh, see how a woman who was asserting her will uh, will gradually be uh, converted into, by her, the very man that she has loved, into uh, someone who is a woman especially used for the whore, and somebody who is probably going to the practice of the So, uh, we are looking, therefore, at a very interesting kind of uh, mode of thinking in which you could move from one kind of crime you could think about one kind of crime and you could associate it with the other very easily. And, and most of these were gendered forms of crime. Right. right. And, and the final thing, thing, of course, which I will not talk about today, Catherine Belsey, very another very important feminist scholar talks about, about. There was a widespread belief that wives had become murderers and that they were, they were apparently frightened husbands who were seeking protection in the courts. So the case of Alice Alden, for example, who uh, anonymously, you know, who uh, apparently killed her husband with the help of her lover, who was uh, the player, became a uh, pretty uh, you know, a text which uh, a play which generated a lot of public interest. Uh, those of you who read The Changeling will uh, remember how it, uh, this is what uh, the actress Joanna Tass, with the help of her man, her son, she uh, he is the man she is in the drop too. So uh, this is the first uh, section of uh, what I wanted to talk about. Which then I move on to the real core, as it were, of uh, this book, which is uh, a simultaneous discussion of the discourses on uh, femininity, women and femininity in the Renaissance, with instances from Higgins. Right, so uh, there are many, there are thousands of discourses that we find in the Renaissance about the women. I just going to talk about four. Right, uh, the first one is, uh, and these are also links to the two, or have as the four figure of the unruly woman. The first is the dangers of female rule. Remember that Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth is on the throne when many of these plays are being written. So, the dangers of female rulers, this is just not less, but there have been many women who were rulers during the early modern period, during the medieval period, and later. The second is the humanist debate about female education. You know about humanism, you know that it is about education. But what happened when they were trying to educate women? Right? Very few women got education. But what were the dangers of having women educated? 
The third is uh, the transvestite controversy. Transvestite, of course, you know, is cross-dressing, right? So the fact that there were quite a few women, and this was more true more of the 17th century, but also true of the 16th century, who dressed in real life women who were dressing as men. So they were wearing the hose, the doublet, they were wearing a cap, and sort of, you know, gagging about, as they called it. Uh, we also went to the theatre to do what you please. Right. So there is a lot of anxiety about the fact that women are behaving like men. But that's another form of unruliness. And this, of course, is very significant as far as we're concerned. She took me to space because you have many young women, quite a few young women, let us say, who uh, dress as men, especially in the colleges. And we talk about not least women, but another uh, sort of, you know, the expression of anxiety about another woman who was cross-dressed and it's not in disguise, that is uh, Joan of Arc or Joan of Hussein in the, the first part of the pieces. And uh, finally, this is also the shoe on the woman with an uncontrolled style. Right? So, these are the four categories that I'm looking at. The dangers of female rule, the points or the dangers of female education, the transvestite woman, that is the woman who is cross-dressed, and the shoe. So within these four categories, what were the kind of uh, anxieties that were uh, created? So the first category, that is uh, the dangers of female rule, uh, the, the discourse that I have in mind is John Knox. Right, which, which is called the first blast of trumpet against the monstrous regiment of women. Right, right? just know the term monstrous regiment. So, the fact that any woman who is ruling is necessarily naturally monstrous. Right, this is what he says. Let me just quickly read out two sentences from this text. He says, To promote a woman to bear rule, superiority, dominion, or empire about any realm, nation, or city is repugnant to nature, it goes against nature. Consumely to God, it goes against the order of God. A thing most contrary to his revealed will and approved ordinance against the ordinance of God against natural law. It is the subversion of good order, of equity, and justice. So, this therefore establishes that any woman who becomes a monarch is necessarily a monstrous person. Right. Now, there is, a, there is a, the irony of the fact that uh, Knox's work was uh, published during the time of Elizabeth. But Knox was a person who didn't want to write uh, about Elizabeth, he wanted to write about the Catholic priests. Uh, unfortunately, it was Mr. Dines. But uh, this, this, this was a harangue in which he was sort of writing against Elizabeth. But then even when he was so older, he refused to uh, completely cut out. He said that, yes, in some cases, as in this particular case, and this is something that other protestant thinkers would also say, people like John Homer, they would say that in this particular case, this is an exception. Elizabeth is an exception to the rule, but by and large, suppose we're looking at Mary Queen of Scots or, you know, Kathleen Mary, uh, we are of course looking at the monstrous regiment to the monstrous Now, this was also a kind of slur against which or within which Elizabeth had to function. So, how did Elizabeth respond to this? Uh, she, she responded in very interesting ways. Right. The first thing that she did, and this is what the court had actually uh, expected of her, or the courtiers had expected of her, the nobleman, that she would marry. Right. So, when the queen was married, it was a much easier thing. It is completely possible and acceptable that once the queen married, her powers were then vested in her husband. She became the queen regnant and to solve the problems. So, she was actually not ruling. Her husband was ruling. But Elizabeth refused to get married. Right. And uh, there was a lot of, therefore, anxiety about this queen who was not getting married. So she created around herself, and this is very interesting, uh, 
through her uh, coach boys, people like Edward Spencer and others, of herself as a very changed woman with links to certain goddesses such as Diana. But she was a virgin queen. But on the other hand, she also claimed to have been married to her kingdom. She said, I'm married to my kingdom. And she held up her hand wearing her coronation ring and said that I am married to my nation, I'm the nation's wife. And at the same time, she would also say that I'm the husband of the nation. She was both the high wife and the husband. And she continuously kept shifting her brows very instantly. Second is that she spoke about the medieval notion of the king's two bodies. The king, which is the body natural, which is the body of a frail woman, and the body politic, right, which is the body of a king. And this dual corporeality, this physical, split across gender lines, created the powerful myth of an androvinous monarch who was an exception to political position. So she was just not any woman who was ruling. She was a woman who, in 1588, and still has said that she had the body of a weak and feeble woman, but the heart and the stomach of the king and the king of England. Right? And she was dressed, of course, in this uh, martial year. And she was visiting the soldiers who were very demoralized, and she was trying to you know, drum up a lot of uh, enthusiasm for the war. So, this was a kind of discourse that Elizabeth also created around herself in order to for her reign, in order to be able to sort of rule, rule right? But uh, new historicism in particular have shown us that the celebration of Elizabeth, which was there in poetry, in pages, in appropriations of popular folk uh, cultures like the May Queen, uh, was always balanced by, was always uh, went hand in hand with the hostility in the popular imagination about the queen. Right? Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but one of the ways in which uh, the word queen was spelled in the Renaissance is Q-U-E-A-N, which meant a whore. Uh, sexually, a woman of sexually was moral. So when they said, oh, our queen, they were actually talking in vague terms about a woman who was sexual morals were very different from that of what normative men were supposed to have. And of course, you know that this is famous for her many affairs that she had with the promoters, some of whom she later uh, ordered to be beheaded because they went against her. So here was a very, very powerful woman. Now, one of the issues that has often been uh, discussed by feminist historians is that it was because of the presence of Elizabeth that we have in many uh, of the uh, Shakespearean comedies and Androvinus heroine. Right. But the presence of the Androvinus heroine is not necessarily to be linked with the presence of the queen, but it could be. Uh, you remember, of course, Shakespeare is playing around with the idea of the transvestite theatre, that these were young boys who were playing the roles of uh, women, and so you could, therefore, uh, in the course of the play, have a situation, have a plot, in which they were uh, going to be in the disguise of a uh, man, and thereby go back to being themselves, right? But there is more to it uh, than uh, that, and I'll just uh, talk about that briefly. So, Elizabeth's reign had a lot of anxiety, a lot of celebration, maybe with a lot of anxiety all around. So, when the Queen died and uh, the successor was made, both James VI of Scotland would become James I of England of Scotland. There was a great deal of assurance, a great deal of sigh of relief amongst the people. Why? Because he was a man, married, and with a son who was going to become the king. Of course, you know, James' sexual preference and that he liked boys more than women was not something that worried them. So as this, one of the very famous sayings of the Renaissance was that, uh, you know, of course, that this is what they need to do. Uh, the king is dead and long live the king. In this particular case, they were saying, the queen is dead and long live the king. So, so the fissures, old lines that should be created in the patriarchy, in, in the presence of the queen, queen it was actually spelled with the coming of a monarch, male monarch to the throne. 
Now for us, what is interesting, for you, what is particularly interesting is that, and many uh, projects have remarked about this, uh, there is an uh, interesting shift between Shakespeare's Elizabethan days and his Jacobian drama. One is, of course, of the genre, that is, he's writing more comedies during the time of Elizabeth, and most of his mature tragedies are written during the time of James I. More importantly, that there is a kind of marked misogyny, a hatred of women, especially women in power, in Shakespeare's Jacobian days. You would be familiar with uh, Macbeth. You would might also be familiar with King Lear, right? So, uh, if you look back on a text like King Lear, for example, and the representations of Connery and Regan, right, the two elder daughters that Shakespeare, that King Lear has, uh, you remember that uh, they are cruel women. Women could easily be called monsters because they have no forms that destroy frail old men. They blind to and throw Lear out into the storm. Lear uh, abuses them as being monstrous. And the point is, why do we need to have this? So why do plays represent uh, women as uh, this, this particular play, which is very powerful play, uh, represent women as monstrous figures? Something very interesting is happening here. That if King Lear has to have an appeal as a tragedy, then you will need to have sympathies for this old man. And how can you have sympathies for this old man? You can have that, that by representing his daughter, and of course there is a sign in the case of Buster, as terrifying people. As terrifying people, which will then arouse your pity for this frail man who may have, while while was the king, not been a very good king. Right. But this thing about uh, gerontocracy, that is, of the power of the old the power and the kind of appeal that the old elderly or the old have is what Lear plays on. And it plays on through a kind of misogyny, through a representation of honorary and agreement as monstrous. But more interestingly, this is in the history play, at least in one history play, which is not a Jacobian drama, it's a Indian play, that uh, we have the representation of a female monarch as truly monstrous. And that's the Henry case, in which you have Margaret of Anjou, right? This Margaret who was married to Henry the Thick, as a woman who was unscrupulous, manipulative, shrewd, heartless, and who has no hopes of also in sacrificing the men who have loved her and who are controlled by her. But in this particular case, of course, we're looking not only at any female monarch, but we're looking at the French woman. That is somebody who is foreign and therefore other. So there is a kind of larger discursive destruction of monarchy, female monarchy in our day life. The first part of every day. Well, not just the first part, the first and the last part of the part three of Henry the sixth, in which Margaret really becomes this very powerful person. However, the other representation which I find more interesting is uh, that of Joan. We don't talk about it in the context of what we call the transvestite controversy. Are you with me so far? Is this uh, something that you're okay with? Yes, ma'am. Uh, then I'll go on to the next uh, section. Uh, it's 3.48 uh, already, so... I don't know, Vivek, is Vivek here? How much time do I have? Oh, this was this one. Okay, so this is uh, I have no call. I, I so this is the, I don't want to talk about what I want to talk about. So, do I have around 20 minutes? Yes, ma'am. I don't know if you want to get into the No, no, no. I don't think that would be impossible. Let's just try and so get through the main points that I want to talk about. And then we'll buy it up. So, so that, that is the anxiety about women's room. The second is humanist education. This is something that you would, of course, be familiar with. The fact that the Renaissance is characterized by 
uh, the revival of learning, especially uh, Latin uh, learning, not Greek, what you use so much, Latin learning, and uh, the fact that this learning was meant to sort of create humans, better humans. So, of course, it was actually creating men who would be trained to do a certain kind of systemic administration. The point, of course, is that it was an education meant for men and not women. There were some aristocratic women, including Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth, who received a certain kind of education. But we're not looking at whether women received education or not, some of them did. But there was a lot of anxiety about what this education meant. So even when there were women like Isota and Ginevra, Nubarola, Cassandra Bedell, Alessandra Sala, Margaret Moore, who was the daughter of Thomas Moore, uh, aristocratic noble women who were educated, this is always a portioning by very famous historians like these Erasmus, Thomas More, against the unfeminine nature of advanced learning. Right? Women were often actually encouraged to learn Greek and not Latin because Greek was a dead language. But Latin was the language of official use, it was the language in which there was law, it was the language in which you studied this. Right. So this was a professional, this was a professional language. Do you remember this parish room? Okay. Uh, you, if you are familiar with Castiglione's The Book of the Courtier, which is uh, uh, one of the very famous uh, sort of, you know, books uh, popular during that time, uh, there is a character called Gaspar Palavicino who makes the spacious remarks about women having women as governors, lawmakers, military generals, as an expression of uh, which of course is really, this is an expression of patriarchal anxiety. This is a kind of similar kind of thing that happens with women's education in the uh, in the 19th century, especially in Bengal. We may call it a story that I know. Uh, they would say that, oh, why do we need to educate women? Will they become uh, appeals? Will they become lawyers? Will they start getting about on the streets? And what is going to happen to our families? And what is going to happen to our children? And there were stories that, you know, if a woman was uh, given a lot of education, highly educated, then she would use her husband to become a widow, she could become blind. So these are ways in which anxiety in the patriarchy is created about the education of women. Thomas More, a very remarkable person in the, the Renaissance, took a special interest in the education of his daughter. But uh, told his daughter, Margaret, that uh, she had to keep her education for private circulation or else it would compromise her chastity or virtue. So this is the slippage that I've been talking about. A woman who's educated could also become very easily an unchaste woman. A woman who would talk to men, would talk to women. Right. So... The, the two plays that you might be familiar with, two of Shakespeare's uh, comedies that you might be familiar with, are All is Well, The Tennis Well, and The Merchant of Venice. The Merchant of Venice, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, right? Now, in both these plays, uh, you have women, uh, in the case of All is Well, The Tennis Well, Helena, who has uh, the knowledge of medicine, and in the case of uh, Merchant of Venice, Portia, who is, has the knowledge of law. Not in both cases, they don't go to schools, they don't go to universities, they are not even educated privately, but they get this knowledge, which they use very expertly from their uh, male relatives, in the case of Helena from her father, in the case of Portia from her cousin. But the question is, how then do you deal with such women who have gained knowledge, who are out in the public? So they become metaphorically women in breaches. Right, Helena is definitely metaphorical. And in the case of Portia, she's dressed as a man in the court. So how do you deal with the fact that here is a woman who's rich, who's aristocratic, who speaks well, who is out in the court, uh, you know, doing what is called the defense? You do this, you make it kind of uh, possible, you mitigate this as a possibility by having Portia destroy China. Nobody else can, remember? He's a Jew, he's a rich Jew, he's a person who possesses, a, you know, this is a kind of threat to the Christian society. But Antonio has uh, abused in the public, Sanyo has 
borrowed money from him, but none of them had this ability to completely wash or destroy Bushmans. So we're looking, therefore, at a very interesting possibility created in the play where a woman's learning, which could be threatening, is actually put to a patriarchal business. But I would say, and this is what feminists have said, I'm not alone in saying this, Manchester West is probably a very ambiguous place, especially towards the end, where Portia and the rest of the baby have this control over their husbands, but they say that if you have lost our wings, it really means that now we can sleep with those men to whom we lost your wings. Right. And uh, there are also so men involved, they are themselves, they have taken the race to the court. But the fact that Portia can make a remark like this and that it's not being punished is a sign that this is one of those common plays that we are looking at. The problem is the sense of it allows a certain kind of dominion power to the character of the woman. Uh, but the really interesting and truly complex and problematic representation of the learned lady, I think, is in an earlier Shakespearean play, a uh, Roman play, uh, which is Titus Petronius, the tragedy which is a steeped in blood, war, mutilation, and revenge. It's a revenge tragedy, it's a Roman revenge tragedy. In which you have a character that's called Lavinia. Lavinia, who is the daughter of Titus, who is the eponymous hero of this play. And uh, Lavinia is raped. And it's an obedient story. Uh, so if you're familiar with Ovid's Metamorphoses, uh, you will know that one of the most famous stories of rape in the Renaissance, which they inherited from the classical times, is the rape of Philomel. Philomel is raped by her. A brother in law, this is the husband of uh, the sister, probably, the man of Altarius. And after the rape, what he does is he cuts off the tongue so that she cannot talk about the rape. What does the lament do? She weaves her story in a tapestry. Think about a tapestry. It's a story in which it is done with uh, embroidery, but it's a narrative. So she weaves like a letter, she writes a kind of letter. In her embroidery, in her shuttle, she weaves it and sends it to her sister. And together they take revenge. Now, in the case of Titus and Jonixus, there is a double mutilation. That is, Lavinia's tongue is cut off by her ribs, and they also cut off her hands, chop off her hands from here to do so, so, so basically, it means that she cannot write. She is a learned lady. What does she do? There is a scene, a pretty, very moving, dramatic uh, moment in which uh, Lavinia, in the she's in the library, her uh, father's library, she turns to the pages of her book towards us. And, and she comes to the section which is Hoxtix of Bogart's Metamorphosis, which is the rape of Philomel. So her father, her uncle, her brothers who had seen her, uh, you know, bloody and mutilated, and yet had not understood that this is one of the reasons for this would have been a rape, looks at text and the understands that this must be the truth. So we are looking very interestingly at what we would call a textual evidence of truth. A textual evidence which alone will uh, allow the man to take revenge, to take revenge, by killing Tamora and her sons who are responsible for the rape, but he also kills the daughter. So this is honor killing. This is a kind of thing that we will give an instance of this honor thing because, of course, she is not a just woman anymore. So she is no good, as it were, for Roman patriarchy. Right. So Tamora, who is a goth, gothic queen, and the queen of the gods, and uh, Lavinia are both dead by the end of the day, killed by Titus. So this, I think, is a very interesting, very complex understanding or representation of the dance lady. Lavinia's learning allows the revenge, but it doesn't allow, or rather, there is no potential for her to be saved because of her learning. What does this play suggest, therefore, about learned ladies? It's a difficult and a complex question. 
The third point, which I wanted to raise, and this is also something that you might be familiar with, is the transvestite controversy, which I've referred to very briefly. So uh, there was a kind of sartorial fashion, a fashion of clothing, uh, in which uh, women were dressing like men. Uh, in 1588, uh, William Averill uh, wrote of man clothed women in these dusts. Though they be insex women, yet in attire they appear to be men and are like androgyny, who counterfeit in the shape of either height or indeed neither, so they are neither men nor women, and plain monsters. So they use the word monsters for the transit right one. So, one of the questions which is often, uh, or one of the issues that is often raised is uh, that, uh, you know, many of Shakespeare's qualities, two gentlemen of Verona, much of the best, twelve point, as they like it, you have transistite heroes, right? Uh, who display great taste, spark, viciousness, you know, these uh, characters. Yes, one of you know, the two things that you might wish to note in this particular case that these women are in disguise as men. In other words, they're just not transvestite heroes. They're just not women who are dressing as men. They take on lady names, right? And it is only for a brief period of time that they are in disguise. They will marry. Right, they will go back to their female uh, attire, they will go back to their being women in the uh, grief, and the period of unruliness will later be taken over by a certain kind of being the butch wife. And in both these places, in Twelfth Night and in As You Like It, there are places where uh, both the Viola and Canada are not a little just as enemies. Viola was just as Cesario. Talk about uh, the frail femininity, the frames, right? Uh, so that's. The question of the quality of being feminine is not something that is. Uh, that can be changed by their male attire, right? So, this is a kind of masquerade that they're doing. And the masquerade as it can be ended, it ends, as it were, for a certain period. So, uh, they are reinstated, as it were, in their normative feminine roles, as wives, as the lovers, and wives. But there is a play in which cross-dressing spells real danger. And, and that, that is uh, the first, first part of Henry the Sixth, and that you have to join the harp or join the cell, as she's called. See, See, the interesting difference between John and the characters like Portia, Viola, Rosalind is the fact that John is not in disguise a man. He's a woman who is dressed as a man because she's going to fight the war. She remains John, right? She's not a man. So, so the fact that here is a woman who is taking on, who has the, the kind of power to take on, uh, you know, the, uh, the attire of a man, the behavior of a man, she defies men, she wins in these battles. This is something that is deeply disturbing for the English, right? Who want to destroy uh, Joan not merely because she is an enemy, but also because she is a woman. And uh, the end of uh, the first part of Henry VI is when Joan is finally caught and uh, she is going to be punished. How is she going to be punished? She's going to be punished as a witch. They say that she has been practicing witchcraft. Otherwise, how could a woman you know, have gained this, uh, these powers? Right. And they burn her as city. Now, this is also historically anachronistic because the English never burned their witches. They just hanged them at different tree. So, the, the burning at stake is a very European uh, phenomenon. It's something that is practiced in the continent uh, throughout. So, the, the truly terrifying moment is that uh, these are not realistic at all. You know, that's precisely what I'm talking about. Uh, there is a question that we will come to. So this is uh, this is a discussion which is clearly about being uh, not realistic, but the representation of theatre and reality. Uh, so what is terrifying in uh, this particular case is the fact that the Jones is made to retract. Uh, so 
there is there are cases where she says you know you can't kill me you you, you can't burn me because you know I'm a I'm a pregnant woman I'm a woman with child and she keeps naming English noblemen one after the other finding Charles uh, saying that you know they, they are the fathers of this child and she is dragged and taken birth. So the fact that you could turn this very heroic woman into a witch at the end of the play is a sign of the fact of the deep misogyny that uh, is part of the culture in which uh, Shakespeare is also writing his plays, and some of it which we think we don't know what Shakespeare felt, we are not asking what Shakespeare felt. But we're looking at plays and we are looking at fictional evidences of fact that this is possible and it's possible on. Uh, I'm witnessing more and more people leaving um, uh, this, this uh, evidently uh, not something that people are uh, liking. Uh, I'm quickly uh, ending this discussion with the final point that uh, I wanted to do. Is it very sad, that, sweetheart? The, the, the character of Rosalind is played by a boy, not by, by a man. Why are you asking questions which I've already addressed? Uh, the final point which I wanted to raise, uh, which I wanted to discuss, is the position of the shoe, the woman within the control of the hundreds of them. The shoe was also a very uh, threatening, frightening figure as far as the early modern period was concerned. And uh, one expression of that is the uh, phrase, the taming of the shoe. And you know, Shakespeare wrote a play called The Taming of the Shoe. Uh, there were many discourses which were on the taming of the town, right? Uh, there was a thing called the Brittle for the Town and uh, the Government of the Town. And for a very long time, uh, there was a contraction which was called, called Brittle, in which the town was actually clutched uh, you know, into your mouth with this iron thing, uh, which made it difficult for women to speak. The second punishment, which was very popular during the early modern period, was dunking women, putting women into horse pots, that is, into ponds in which from which horses drank water or into which they were really, uh, accumulated. So there were many punishments for the shoe, which is why the taming of the shoe, the taming of the tongue of the woman, was a common trope during that period. So we know about the shame of the shoe, but what I want to talk about, and this is the last point that I want to raise, is a very interesting potential of the shoe or the school to be actually giving a kind of position which is positive, which is uh, actually indicated in the play. That is, uh, her subversive potential is actually for questioning male authority is uh, represented as a two, two plays that I have in mind are Helen and the Winter's Day. So, I will not talk about the Winter's Day today, we will just talk about Emilia. And uh, Emilia is Yago's wife, right? And there is a very curious, very interesting kind of thing which is happening in this play. In the initial sort of uh, sections of the play, we have Emilia, who is a person who is completely subservient to her husband. She does not question her husband. It is only in uh, Act 4 that there is a kind of transformation, a transformation which is never really explained in the play. In the Willow scene, the famous Willow scene, in which uh, Destimolo, who is lamenting the way in which Othello has uh, treated her, uh, you know, says that, you know, why does he behave like this? And uh, Emilia says that, uh, well, this is the way in which all men behave. And she says, just not a year or two shows us a man. They are all but stomachs and they are all but fools. They eat us hungrily, and when they are full, they belch us. This is a terrifying image of this consumption of women by men in the sexually and also otherwise. And there is the section, the latter section, the later section of the male speech, which is very close to uh, Shylock's speech, where he says, um, uh, uh, just hilarious, uh, this, uh, this uh, passage, they have not a few eyes. It's very similar to that, what she says. Uh, so, having said that, from this point onwards, 
We see Emilia emerging as a pretty powerful voice, a voice which is a character, a voice who is going to challenge the way in which men treat women, especially accusing them of heterosexual morals. And who is she defending? She is, of course, defending Desdemona. Yet, you remember, it is Emilia who has earlier picked up Desdemona's handkerchief and given it to her husband. So we're not looking at 19th century novels in which we will have to have plausibility or causality. We're looking at a place which are also exploring potentials of certain kinds of thinking, discord, questions, So, uh, towards the end of the play, uh, and uh, I will not discuss the theoretical framing of the women which I discussed in this, uh, which is about the question of dilation and deletion. Dilation is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a way in which you kind of uh, protract something, elongate something, make it longer, to dilate, and also to open up. And deletion is a legal term which means uh, you uh, sort of, uh, make an accusation. So, I would suggest that this is an instance of dilation and dilation together, in which, uh, towards the end of the play, we have Emilia emerging as a voice of a shoe who uh, is refusing to accept the fact that men can accuse women of sexual infidelity, and uh, using a strategy of dilation as a legal indictment. And she, she speaks in public. She is doing public speaking. She is defying, therefore, patriarchal norms of silence, as Peter uh, uh, Stalibras has pointed out, the closed mouth. She is speaking. She is defying the closed mouth. And containment within households. There is a passage in which Yahoo says, Go home, go home. And she says, For chance, Yahoo, I will not go home. I have forsaken the possibility of being a housewife, near a housewife anymore. So, uh, the disclosure, as it were, in the play is also about women's refusal to be within the territory of closure that patriarchy wants you to. So, I would just end by saying that uh, the Kalu is a very interesting play in which uh, the misogynist stereotype of the show is uh, of the female locality, the fact of a woman speaking. It's actually completely overturned. And you have it as representations of valorization of marriage. And I think it bears out Natalie Simone's observation that the disorderly or the unruly woman opened up the scope for new behavioral options for the two and the early modern period. The stage, of course, is not a place where women exist. All the characters, and I just found two questions on this, but this is the position from which I began speaking. There is a Renaissance theater, and stage is necessarily a kind of aesthetic theater. There are no women on stage, but there are women who are characters. And it is these women characters, and the plays are not realistic. But if you are looking at the potentials, the possibilities, feminine possibilities, the possibilities for women as characters, or uh, what we would say the representations of gender, uh, as it were, on stage, then we are looking at a wide range of possibilities. At one level, there is deep misogyny, there is a reinstating of patriarchal positions. On the other hand, as in the case of Emilia and Paulina, there is a possibility which is actually being opened up uh, for questioning of uh, male authority. So Shakespeare's plays, and I've just spoken about Shakespeare's plays today, uh, reveal very interesting relationships between the discourse and uh, performance. This one form of cultural performance, that is the drama of the uh, so this is where I would uh, end my discussion, suggesting that the unruly woman uh, was a source of a lot of anxiety, but the unruly woman could also be a place for a certain kind of celebration. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Ma'am, we have one question. Yes, you have all of you have one question. Okay, that's interesting. Yes, yes. Oh, ma'am, uh, there's a question by Dipuru Ghosh. Does he do that? Yes, I just read that, and that is what I answered. There is no representation which is realistic. 
thank, thank you so, so much for even noticing that I was listening to the talk with uh, uh, Nat and the chairman. I, I think that is something that uh, you must all have done too. And uh, the one of the things that I really wanted to mention, if you really ask me, was cool. I think, I think the, the, the combination of you know, Renaissance scholarship and feminist scholarship bringing two, uh, two very, very, I would say, um, radical and obstinate kind of scholarships in certain sense. Because Renaissance scholarship is almost a kind of a scholarship in classical knowledge, which is very conservative by the tradition of identity. And feminist scholarship is all about, you know, I kind of have and revising and existing opinion and changing that. So, so this whole combination of bringing the two together, and as Professor uh, uh, Gangli must have uh, uh, made clear to you by now, the beginning of this scholarship before it came in was not Uh, you know, was of a certain kind, of a very conservative kind. All the Renaissance as a period itself is the seedbed of all kinds of radicalism. So I think the, the, coming, the coming together of these two and the development of feminist thought, visually all other forms of literary criticism, new historicism, and cultural theorism, and carving a completely independent and very ingenious way of looking at Renaissance today, is something that uh, I, I believe young students at this stage must uh, pay attention to. And And, and, and appreciate. I think that's, uh, that's, that's, that's something that I really wanted to draw your attention to. I mean, apart from several individual, uh, brilliant, uh, elite pieces of individual text, uh, and, and uh, even the quality of uh, the Renaissance, you know, the, the question of um, uh, the, the discourse around the mean and how to reach uh, science of a particular age, not just in the text, but literary text, but also otherwise. I think I'm, I can't say more than, more than that if I start and it will become another long talk. Thank you so much for this great uh, talk. Thank you, Arjun. Yes, I did not have much uh, scope to talk about the deep picture that exists in this scholarship itself. Uh, it will exist to the beginning of the 20th century. I didn't have to talk, for example, in a big way about the heart. But it is, I think, uh, the, that seems to be like the standard reception also of the Renaissance age because this is now, of course, seen as the one moment, three modern, early modern moment, which is leading closest to classical learning, and classical revival, and so on, so, which is, of course, all new and new standards. And uh, yes, definitely, in the 19th, the 17th. Uh, I'm also not a scholar. So in the 70s, the 80s, you don't really have women and feminists, men and overall feminists, engaging with the question of uh, gender, with the question of uh, the politics of gender that is existed in India. Uh, and the possibilities of ways of, sort of completely radical ways of reading uh, these uh, texts. Here, for example, which is a completely canonical text, underwent a total revision, for example, with Jonathan Delimo's uh, radical tragedy, which is uh, uh, one of the earliest uh, cultural materialists reading, cultural materialists reading, and also the reading of Jonathan Delimo. Uh, they were not feminists, but uh, they definitely opened up this possibility, opening up uh, uh, the text to different uh, uh, possibilities, not closing them, sealing them as the genius of Shakespeare. So I think yes, that's, uh, that's happening. And, uh, I haven't been able to mention some of the most very, very truly brilliant feminist uh, scholars that we have in the Renaissance. Uh, but yes, uh, somebody uh, who I think you may be familiar with, the belief maker, almost everybody does, Janet Adelman, who is leaning in psychoanalysis, you will never read in the The question of the power that Lady Macbeth has over Macbeth can be traced to uh, the early modern practices in which women have certain rights to be told over men in their childhood. This whole practice of being swapped and taken care of by the uh, wet nurse. And the fact that, you know, there is an image in uh, the that about touching the child against the wall of feeling it could actually come from my stories which are circulated about women who hate children. 
So, yes, uh, Janet, I don't want to be your partner. Uh, I mentioned uh, Karen Newman. Uh, I would say Peter Stanagras, and it's simply very important also in terms of feminist uh, thinking. And uh, for me, uh, and this is something that uh, we've discussed uh, before, I think uh, for me, the consolidation of my feminist thinking actually comes to reading of these relationships and the relationships. So, though I did read very important feminist novels when I was young, when I was in my university, in Japan University, I think it was only when I started doing my research, which I did quite late, that uh, all of these came together, you know, uh, through the reading of a very powerful, uh, very iconic uh, text. And the fact that uh, you could, could do this. this. The, the fact, fact that it is possible to, uh, uh, that these readings were possible, possible actually make possible, possible many other things in, in terms of your know, intellectual development, in terms of your academic world. Uh, so, so, yes, I think, for instance, uh, uh, feminism, feminism, uh, feminist readings of the Renaissance is also a very important, was very, uh, for me, a very important learning process of uh, how to read text against the brain, how to be able to do radical Sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry. Sorry. In terms of the question of a class, if a woman comes from a class, right? Yeah, yeah. the woman do you want to answer this? Yes. yes. The question of class is, of course, central to uh, the inquiry of the races. We know that uh, there is, as I said, nothing called the process we understand. It, it is a privileged class that we are looking at in terms of education. But as far as representation is concerned, we are looking at a wide range. We are looking at uh, the king and the queen, we are also looking, for example, at the malcontents. This is such a familiar figure. We don't have female malcontents in any aspect. We have male malcontents, which would also uh, allow us to look at the question of class in a uh, more serious ways, the representations of what would be in these days service, right? So people who were in service. Uh, by and large, with women, we are looking at uh, maids, maids and maids in waiting, and so on and so forth. Emilia, for example, uh, is a very interesting instance of a uh, different class, right? She comes, unlike Desdemona, she does not come from the village class. She is in the status, probably, of a maid, so she is also a kind of friend. So there's a kind of ambiguity. So the possibility of her speaking up as it were, against later, that is in the middle of the against Othello and against Yahoo, it is very uh, different, for example, from this demonic side. This demonic begins of, as a kind of uh, a woman of spunk, who actually gets enfolded within her own class. That is the class as an upper class woman, a woman who does not do a set of things. So yes, there is definitely a very important component of the class, in the representation of both men and women. Uh, religion, I'm not quite sure.
quite sure whether uh, it has split it, that is, John, how would necessarily allow us to look at uh, this question, specifically, for example, the text that I have in mind with the loop. Paulina is probably uh, functioning as a Catholic in the way in which she. Um, She's, of course, not a woman of the different class. Her class is also that of nobility. She's not a being forced, but her class is less than nobility. But yes, in the case of religion, the fact that she uh, takes away her mind and uh, keeps her away was be something that the Catholic Reaches are to be doing, you know, protecting uh, Catholics from Protestant uh, persecution. So, so I think, yes, this is a very different instances of both classes and religions affecting representations in terms of both the interests of gender. gender. So uh, uh, that would probably be uh, another, another kind of inquiry which uh, probably could not have done this discussion. But yes, this is a very important question. Class, class is something, something which is now not to discussed, but yes, yes uh, there is, uh, class, class is a very, very important uh, component, very important factor in analysis, category of analysis in the in the area of market. If you think of, uh, you know, persons as uh, linear, Right, if you see the consensus is in which so, so why is it being in the past? Because this is a question that the play doesn't really uh, address, except in later in the video says that we have to take care of the houseless poverty. But this houseless poverty is there in the middle. It's there in the fact that he is a king who is taking a unilateral decision and he is not in a subject situation. Very interesting case of a popular uprising, I would say, is in the history of the Right. Uh, if, you if you think, think about the second part of my uh, uh, six, six, which I was first, you have a kind of things rising, which is the most important. So uh, the question of class is technically very important, but she has a question of the question of the marginalized dispossessed, something that is not in this deeply ambiguous. So it's it's if you can just say how much you can get the question. I mean, there is a definite uh, as a similar response than one was thinking of. It is divided and quite ambiguous. I don't know if this is answering the question, but yes, it is. It is definitely. Yeah. Which, which is, is which is allowed, for example, uh, uh, different, different things of text, text like, like the King Lear, Lear, very, very iconic, iconic text. Uh, how, how can you have a different topic like that? It, it is a question of class. We're looking there for at people who are completely dispossessed, who've been turned by poverty, by hunger, and they're the saying that you know we're possessed to the devil. These are the things that you can get into your feelings. Maybe, Maybe the agreement does not be not lost, but as far as, far as representation is concerned, they are definitely there in terms of loss. Thank you so much. I would now invite our to tell you the form of the form. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Am I on? Am I on? Yes, you are. I can hear you. I'm not I'm not trusting you. I'm not trusting you. I'm not trusting you. I'm First, First of all, I would like to thank my sense of what to one, 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 one
on on behalf of, of this event and the performance which is in our society it is because of all that we did for the community this round today is what in continuation of our previous lecture on lecture in the last lecture on 3rd of december we had the interesting concept of the and the right of the medium in a center naturally we had the interesting what was the signal of the medium holistic way what is the summary the lens of all what was the interesting of the medium at the time what are the feminist aspects of the lens I think, I think all, all of our doubt, doubt most of the doubt that we had in this particular instance, knowledge is being captured from continuous discussion of reconstruction, from debate and discussion. I think we can summarize only one topic. is the knowledge but today we are very much in the presentation that we did with all the related aspects of feminist interrogation in the lecture for this i would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to swati jamuli ma'am who took on the work of the one hour to date and there is we think there are about seven or eight students so so far the okay is in the literature my you are doing and that we got a very diverse idea of inquiry in this field So, so thank you so much for your doing so much so the gap between the gender and the gender of women today in the gender so the gender of gender and character you draw you are in the writing Need of the writing of the society and the way that the society is from new level. Indeed, your two generations are more what is it means? Well, 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 what of thanks to we were we were thinking about what kind of service is there in this very short span of time now not to think critically thank you sir to you too for, for your, your motivational and inspiring support, support. keep me lightening us with such kind of talk in, in our second week journey of fitness at last, last Once, once again, again i would like to thank, thank one, one and every one to do this online platform of learning at this juncture i would like to do in my word of thank you and thank, thank you everyone on behalf of the entire team of interest thank, thank you all Thank you, Professor Sir. Once again. Ah, uh, 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 thank you, Professor. Uh, 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 uh